Okay, maybe we can start now. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome Yulia Sauter to this to this uh, meeting series. So this is the 71st. Yeah, this is the 71st meeting of New Directions in Group Theory and Triangulate Categories. And Yulia will talk to us today about tilting theory in exact categories. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ruda Dip, for the invitation. Um, I hope that the timing is roughly okay. I might be actually finishing a bit earlier, but we, let's see. Um, yeah, so tilting theory in exact categories is, um, yeah, I, I must admit, I'm not somebody working with triangulated categories. And for me, tilting theory is kind of the nicest hack to get um, derived equivalences without actually working with the triangulated categories. So one can still work with the exact categories. And I will say the echo again. I hope not. All right. So, um, so let's uh, look at the easiest. Um, well, what you normally do if you have two exact categories, E and E prime, and, and if you want to study derived equivalences only on the level of exact categories, you would look for exact functors between exact categories, which induce derived equivalences. And um, so the, the usual properties that you want is that's homologically exact. Uh, this means you want um, induced isomorphisms on all the X groups, and you want that the image is kind of thick to get the um, yeah, the essential surge activity of your um, derived functor. Um, the problem with this is it's very difficult to find. Yeah, and um, tilting theory for me is an it's the easiest situation how you can get around this. Um, it's in formalism, and um, but you have to restrict to the situation that the target category is a certain functor category. Yeah, as you know it from modules over rings. Um, that's the thing which generalized. And um, yeah, and it, the, the only downside is it doesn't always work. Yeah, one has to find out situation precisely when it works. And um, so these are the motivations. These are the situations which I know where this um, tilting um, leads to derived equivalences. And um, so um, I just uh, saw it shorten these by the letters of the authors. So the most classical thing is tilting modules over RT in algebras and use derived equivalences. That's, um, well, I, so tilting theory, these tilting modules have been studied by Huppel and then the derived equivalence follows by a result from Keller, but there might be other sources. It follows also from a derived from a result of Ricard. So, um, so maybe Keller is not the right person to mention here, but yeah, okay, that's one way how you can get the derived equivalence. Um, and then the other situation I know is relative tilting modules for RT and algebras and use derived equivalences. And again, the so the relative tilting modules were defined by Ausländer Solberg in a sequence of papers in the second paper where they introduce relative exact structures for RT and algebras. And Buan in his PhD proved that um, they induced derived equivalences. And um, the third situation is um, tilting bundles um, in coherent sheaves induced derived equivalences. And so the tilting bundles were defined by Baer, um, Dagmar Baer. And the uh, most famous example of a tilting bundle which induced a derived equivalence is uh, due to Balinson on the PN. Um, yeah, and then I put something else, which is nothing to do with the first three uh, results to show that by now there's also very general situations of tilting subcategories um, in exact categories with enough projectives and injectives have, for example, been studied by Jiang and Zhu, um, even for x triangulated categories. Um, the downside for me for going to such a generality is that um, so the derived equivalence question is uh, problematic to address there because we don't know what the bounded derived category of a X triangle category. But of course, other aspects of tilting theory can be studied for X triangle category, or maybe at some point this as well. But yeah, so far I don't know how to do it. So if one wants to unify all this, then one has to think for a moment what one actually has to do. Yeah. Um, you have to define it for arbitrary exact categories here, yeah? because um, if you think of coherent sheaves, 
then you have not enough projectives and not enough injectives. If you think of relative tilting modules, then you have an exact category. It has still enough projectives, enough injective um, projectives. And um, yeah, so, um, and if you think of this last situation, um, you must have, you must admit uh, possibilities of infinitely many projectives, infinitely many injectives. So um, we first have to uh, worry about the definition in general, and then we should answer what should the, and, and, and induced derived equivalence in this context mean, yeah? And so this is the outline, what I just explained. I first do a little a quick recap on exact categories on the bounded derived category of an exact category. Then I go through my definition of tilting and compare it with the ones which I find the most famous, oh, which I encountered in the literature. And, um, but I must say I'm excluding all types of big tilting and Wakamatsu tilting, infinite tilting and so on. Um, this is basically all inspired by small tilting. This is the only situation I know that you get derived equivalences. I mean, there might be others, but that's what I know. So um, yeah, then let's start. Um, this is probably something you all know, so I don't go too long at this about <laughs> on about this. Um, so an exact category has always two, two data, yeah, an additive category an underlying and an, um, a class S of kernel co-kernel pairs. Uh, you'll be noted here as I and D, and um, these will be called short exact sequences. And the point about the short exact sequences, sequences is that AS can be realized as an extension closed subcategory in a abelian category. Yeah, so I mean, so the short exact sequences will just be the one in the abelian category. There are several ways of realizing that, and a priori um, from such a definition, it wouldn't be clear that, uh, for example, on the higher X groups, you, you might have completely different extension groups from the abelian category or, yeah. So this is just completely different theory then. Um, yeah, and then um, I need the notion of um, exact sequence. And so, um, yeah, so amorphism is admissible or strict if, uh, if it can be composed as first a deflation and then an inflation. And um, uh, a sequence of composable morphisms is exact if, it, if every morphism is admissible and it decomposes into short exact sequences at every of the objects. Yeah, I mean, um, at every middle of the objects. Um, yeah, so we fix an exact category. And then the other notions we have is um, projectives. An object P and E is projective. Um, if home PD is surjective for every deflation D. And then we uh, look at PE, the category of projectives in E. And we say E is with enough projectives, I just write it as WEP. If, we are ob if, if for every object X there's a deflation, P to X is P projective. And WEI means with enough injectives, and that's the dual definition. Um, and then you can define the projective dimension in any exact category. So if X is an object in E, we say projective dimension is small equal N. If X N plus one E, X blank is zero. Yeah, for every, um, yeah. So this is um, just the obvious generalization. Yeah, I should have said that. So every exact category has, an, has a bifunctor X one. And um, you can also using the um, UNIDA definition, I mean, this, um, this, usual definition of um, equivalence classes of n exact sequences to define the higher x groups. Um, that's actually not so easy to find in literature, but um, yeah, there are several accounts on it somewhere. Um, so, and then for uh, subcategory chi, we define the projective dimension to be the supremum of all the projective dimension in it. And um, I need this category p smaller infinity um, sometimes, I mean, uh, yeah, this is Auslander's notation, and sometimes there would be the bracket E behind it. Um, you see all the objects of um, finite projective dimension and I smaller E infinity, yeah, so of in finite infinite dimension. And so we call an exact category regular if everything, every object has finite projective dimension. And um, 
Yeah, so if you don't know what regular means, then often it means already finite global dimension. Yeah, if you have an, um, uh, if you have a finitely many epsilon simples in your exact category and everything has a finite length composition series, then um, regular is equivalent to glo finite global dimension. Um, so for example, if you have um, a billion with finite lengths and finitely many simples, then you have um, regular as equivalent to finite global dimension. Yeah. And so examples of exact categories are really everywhere. Um, yeah, so abelian categories, of course, um, extension closed subcategories and exact categories, um, finally presented modules, Gorenstein projectives, perpendicular categories, vector bundles, extension closed subcategories in every exact categories form a lattice. And um, you can also take exact substructures of exact categories, for example, split exact structure, or this is always the minimum, minimal one, or Ausner Solberg exact structures. Um, yeah, well, they generalized even through X triangle categories. It's a relatively easy way of um, you just take a home functor and look at the exact structure, making the home functors exact. Um, and yeah, so in all exact substructures form an exact category, uh, for, form, an ex um, form a lattice. And this is also studied in several other um, articles, this lattice. Um, yeah, so I care about, um, so for tilting theory, we need a specific type of extension closed subcategories, or a priori just um, additive categories. So um, for that, I introduced some notation. I hope this is not too, um, too much. I mean, I hope it's relatively easy to understand um, what the notation should mean. Um, so if you take a subcategory chi of E, um, then n presentations, I mean, um, so press n chi is the objects m and e, which have an n presentation in chi. And this means that we have an exact sequence uh, like that with x, i, and chi. And um, yeah, so right exact, um, it means that uh, this morphism is uh, still admissible and um, yeah, the image here is uh, the x, uh, n minus one, and so on. And um, and then it's exact in all these places. Um, and so, and rest n chi um, is everything where these presentations are actually exact here, yeah? So where this last map is not just admissible, admissible but an in inflation. Um, uh, the only convention I have, I always start with zero, with these kind of, um, uh, presentations and resolutions. And um, yeah, instead of press n, you can define press infinity analog to press n with infinite resolutions. And res chi is a union of everything which has some finite resolution for some n in chi. Um, and then we say chi in e is, um, is resolving if it is, um, yeah, so this is the most crucial um, notion. Um, uh, if it's extension closed, closed under kernels of deflations and um, everything has a deflation from chi to E, yeah? And then we um, strengthen these to finitely resolving um, if it is resolving and everything has a finite resolution in chi or N resolving if res N is E, yeah? So, um, <clears throat> Yeah, so this is just what I said. Resolving is extension closed, deflation closed, and press zero is E. Uh, finally resolving is also res is E, and N resolving is res, res N is C, yeah? Um, so if E has enough injectives, then um, one can look at perpendicular categories. This is everything. Um, yeah, I will use this notation later on a lot. Everything um, in E such that um, the extensions with objects in X. Um, so every positive extension is a zero. And because you have enough injectives, then this perpendicular category um, is also co-resolving. Yeah, you have the injectives in here and they give you the, um, if you have an object in E, you can always find an inflation in this injective, um, in an injective. Um, and this is then um, an, showing that this perpendicular cut is co-resolving, right? 
And then the other thing we need is um, we need functor categories, but not any functor category. We need functor categories with enough projectives. Um, yeah, so if you take an, a small additive category and you might first look at mod chi, which is all contravariant additive functors on chi to abelian groups. And that one um, is a bit too big for us. So we look at a, a smaller exact category. We look at extension closed subcategories um, mod n chi in it. And the smallest one we're looking at is mod infinity chi. Mod n chi um, are the ones such that there exists an, a fine, um, an exact sequence like that. Yeah, so all the Fs which have a, actually these are these these representable functors here are then um, finitely generate projectives and um, yeah so if you have um, n presentations this is finitely generated projectives then um, this is a definition of mod n chi and mod infinity chi means that uh, this um, sequence can be infinitely continued. Um, yeah, and then the point about mod infinity chi is that, um, yeah, this is a, the, in some sense a, the largest, um, the largest exact type category with enough projectives given by chi. And uh, this is, um, yeah, I probably shouldn't have dedicated it to Inomoto, but that's where I found it, yeah. Um, in Inomoto's master theory, master thesis on his web page, you can find that. Um, so if you have a small additive category and you look again at this category more infinity P, um, and then you look at all the additive, yeah. And, and so you look at um, an exact category with enough projectives given by P. And then we look at the uh, usual Yoneda functor and we restrict it to P. And because we had enough projectives, we land in mod infinity P. And uh, the point is that the image of P um, uh, is resolving if we assume I important complete. Yeah. Um, uh, if you don't assume I important complete, it's pre resolving and um, you can go through the I important completion and then it becomes resolving. But um, I would just assume I important complete. That's from this point on. Um, yeah. So. Um, that's an important class, and this is what one needs to, yeah. So um, everything with enough projectives given by P is a resolving subcategory at mod infinity P, and vice versa. Yeah, why is this easy embedding? Um, okay, DBE. Um, you look at um, the chain complexes in your additive um, category, underlying additive category A, um, and then look at the acyclic um, complexes inside there with respect to your exact structure. Yeah, so these chain complexes don't com depend on the exact structure at all, but uh, the acyclic complexes, of course, they do. And um, since we assume I important complete, they always give a thick subcategory and the derived category is a vertical quotient, um, which you can always define. And um, so the question is, is this now just like in the case that we look at um, bounded ref category for abelian categories? And the answer is, um, yeah, there are some differences one needs to know. Um, so for example, there's no standard T structure. That's one of the big um, yeah, shortcomings of this. And there's no cohomology functor. Um, yeah, because complexes could be um, made up of not admissible morphisms. No? Um, uh, and the other problem that one has is um, derived functors. Yeah, whenever you have an exact functor for, between exact categories, it's really no problem. You can find all the derived functors, but as soon as you have a left exact or however differently defined additive functor, and maybe you don't have enough projectives or enough injectives, then um, you need to come back to the linear definition of um, derived functors and um, yeah, sometimes they exist, sometimes they don't. And um, yeah, so you find it, you can look into Bula. It's quite a complicated technical thing to understand when they exist and they're not. Um, 
I prefer not to use it and uh, just work with exact functors because there everything is clear. Um, okay, and then what one also can have in this situation is that we might have extension closed subcategories, um, which are really different, uh, which may induce derived equivalences. And the, um, the nicest class of subcategories which do these, or one of the classes which do these, um, is uh, finitely resolving categories. And that's uh, due to Henrad von Rosmalen. And it's a, well, there's an, an earlier result by Keller. Um, yeah, not on the bounded derived category level, but it's the same condition. But, uh, no, I think it's also on the bounded derived category, but he calls this left and right co final and it's a more general notion than co resolving and resolving. Um, yeah, so um, this is the Henrad von Rosmalen version. Um, we take an exact category. And if chi is finitely resolving or co-resolving, then the inclusion induces a triangle equivalence dBx nach dBe. If uh, it is also n resolving or co-resolving, then um, this triangle equivalence even extends to um, the unbounded derived category. Yeah. So since we mostly care about, or I care about the bounded derived category for me, finitely resolving is enough. I don't need um, the n resolving or co-resolving. Um, right, but that's a crucial thing, these kind of classes, for tilting theory at least. Um, so um, we define um, a subcategory um, in E to be n tilting or tilting. I mean, uh, if uh, the perpendicular category has enough projectives and um, the projectives are given by T itself. Yeah, so this is just a short way of writing this. Perpendicular category is always extension closed and it has to have these extra properties. And um, yeah, so and so sometimes I want this n, and sometimes I don't want the n. The reason is, so the classical situation would be defining n tilting. But since I want to generalize all notion of tilting that I know, I also want to generalize uh, tilting in, in db epsilon, yeah? And there, tilting is not defined as n tilting. That would mean that you generate in n, that you um, do um, have n generation steps for your six subcategories. And um, since we don't want to specify the n, we might want to allow just infinitely many steps is generated. Um, we need to also have a notion without an n, yeah? Where we allow here, um, here, uh, Arbitrary, I mean, for n tilting, the core resolutions have to be length n from zero to n. And uh, for tilting uh, in general, they just have to be finite. So, and tilting is n tilting if and only if you also have the projective dimension smaller equal n condition. Yeah. So, in most situations, I will assume this. And um, if t is n tilting, then one now sets a six subcategory that it generates in E is um, everything of finite projective dimension. Um, let's have an example of tilting, but not end tilting. We look at um, uh, the representations of this infinite quiver. This is kind of um, uh, over a field, finite dimensional representations. Then it's an abelian category with enough projectives and enough injectives. Uh, the Ausner Wright quiver is very easy written down here. And um, you take T to be injectives. This is the same as the projectives and as one, yeah? And um, so I should say these dotted lines means that the composition is zero, yeah? I uh, divide out the radical square relation everywhere. Um, yeah, so then one sees that uh, very easily that T is um, tilting, but not n tilting since the projective dimension of S1 is infinite. Or in other ways, if you look at the SIs, and increase the i, then you need longer and longer um, uh, core resolutions. Um, um, yeah, to to um, core resolving things. Yeah. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Then let's um, look at other descriptions. Um, uh, yeah. So the Batoni description is an easy way of uh, describing the checking tilting in in explicit situations. If you have an additive category, um, if you have T and E and assume a projective dimension smaller equal N, then T1 is equivalent to, you need self-orthogonal, this is this inclusion, 
and the perpendicular is contained in press NT. Yeah. And when you have this inclusion, then you get equality even on the level of press n minus one to all the higher press, um, even to press infinity to equal to press perp. And then let's compare this with um, other situations. The classical thing is if you have enough projectives in E, then of course everybody can write down what tilting should mean. Um, yeah, then T has to be self orthogonal and closed under summons, projective dimension smaller equal n. And PE, um, the projectives have n co solutions in T. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's actually in this case some work to prove that this is equivalent to the other definition. And if E has enough injectives, then T is n tilting if and only if um, it fulfills its projective dimension smaller equal n. And we have the Batsoni condition and the um, the finitely co-resolving condition is automatic. Yeah, we don't have to do anything because of the injectives. Um, okay, and then the other classical definition is tilting in triangulated category. Um, in a triangulated category C, um, one calls a full additive subcategory T tilting if, um, yeah, so this is the self-orthogonal condition. Um, and so no homes, um, and uh, in, in shifts which are, um, yeah, in, in actual shifts of T. Um, and the smallest triangulated cut, thick subcategory containing T is the whole category C. Yeah. And um, this is related to the notion of tilting that I introduced in the following sense. Um, yeah. So T is tilting in E if and only if um, uh, tilting in E and fulfills this condition. The six subcategory generates as E is equivalent to T is tilting in DBE. Yeah. But now notice this condition is very strong. If projective dimension is smaller n, then we know that um, uh, uh, the six subcategory of T is P smaller infinity. So this equality means E is smaller, E is equal to P smaller infinity. Um, so if you want tilting in DBE, um, you need to have you need to restrict to E regular. Yeah. Um, in all the other cases, this definition doesn't work. Yeah. Um, oops. Uh, thick ET. Um, yeah, so in an exact category, um, thick means uh, the two out of three properties and closed under summons. Yeah, so you just take the smallest thick subcategory and the exact category containing T. Mm. Uh, yeah, so then, um, then classical results on tilting theory are, for example, um, the auslander reiten correspondence. Um, here is a rather trivial version where you don't have to work anything at all. So we look at the, the question is, can we characterize tilting subcategory through its perpendicular category? And um, yeah, so the, um, this is a rather stupid characterization. Yeah, um, that's basically the definition. T is n tilting if and only if um, T perp is an n co resolving subcategory within a projective of the form. Look, that's just the definition. No? But uh, the, the clue is that um, if you have other assumption on your exact category, um, like here, enough projectives, enough injectives, that's what always is assumed in the noun proofs, then you can replace two by this class still n co-resolving um, and covariantly finite and closed under summons. Yeah, this is much easier to check than with enough projectives of this form. Yeah, um, yeah. so that's why it's attracted a lot of attention. Um, it would be nice to generalize to situations with only enough projectives, for example, but I actually don't know the proofs that exist. There are always uh, variations of the original proof of us in the writing and they just have enough projectives and injectives in that situation. And then the other partial order order is, um, uh, sorry, and then the other thing is the partial order that you always have for um, n tilting subcategories. Um, yeah, this is kind of the expected thing. Um, yeah, so what I want to point out here is, um, uh, yeah, so if you look at C, it says, um, tilting, M tilting in E um, with uh, this inclusion is equivalent to M tilting in T perp. 
Yeah, but no T perp is an exact category with enough projectives, and there it's easier to check if it's tilting or not. Yeah, so one can kind of reduce this to um, to the situations where one is again in a situation with enough projectives. Um, yeah, and then let me uh, explain the obvious uh, corollary. Um, yeah, so we have this partial order um, given by uh, T tilde is um, smaller equal T if the higher if all extensions um, between T and T tilde are zero, and um, yeah, if E is an exact category, T an n tilting subcategory, and T tilde an m tilting subcategory, and then the inclusion implies that they have to be equal. Yeah, and this is because we have T tilde smaller equal T and T smaller equal T tilde. If you have this. Um, yeah, therefore they're equal because it's a partial order. Yeah, um, yeah here a word of warning. Um, if you have um, maximal self-orthogonal subcategories, they are often not tilting. Yeah, so even in hereditary abelian categories with enough projectives, this can happen. Um, yeah. Um, and then the open question here is, yeah, is this pose set um, always connected? Um, Connected here means, um, yeah, you find between any two points, you find a sequence of um, a finite sequence such that um, every um, uh, consecutive ones are comparable. Yeah, so either smaller equal or lar larger equal in the pole set. Um, uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about the Hasse diagram in this context anymore, um, but one can ask these kind of questions. And if you have enough projectives, then the projectives are trivially a maximal element in this pose set and therefore is always connected. Um, but in general, we don't know. Mm, yeah, so let's come to eye deck tilting. Um, here we start with, um, uh, sorry, actually it's enough to start with uh, tilting. Um, yeah, you start with T tilting and you look at the um, uh, Functor from Inamoto, because T perp has enough projectives, I can embed it into mod infinity T as a resolving subcategory. Um, and then I look at the following diagram. Um, so this is what I usually will call the tilting functor. And then this is exact. So um, this one will be the derived tilting functor. Um, right. And then we now T perp is finitely co resolving. So by Henrad uh, van Roosman, we have an equivalence induced by the in inclusion. Um, T perp is exact equivalence as equivalent as an exact category to its image under this functor. So we have an, a triangle equivalence here. And now the problem appears: image P and more infinity P is resolving, but we don't know if it's finitely resolving. Yeah, and uh, this is kind of the obstruction for this uh, being an equivalence, derived equivalence, a triangle equivalence. Yeah, and so phi is always a fully faceful functor, exists for all tilting subcategories or n tilting even, um, uh, just always exists. And um, uh, and the question is if it's a derived equivalence, and for that we need to answer if um, this uh, image p here is finitely resolving. And then there are some situations where this is trivial. Um, yeah, if you have some regularity assumptions, then you get this for free. If T is n tilting in E, and um, uh, sorry, I, I've had a version where this is not for general. If T is tilting in E and more infinity is um, T is regular, then T is IDEC n tilting. And um, as an example, we think of tilting sheaves. Uh, they always induce derived equivalences defined by Bayer. This is because they assume that the endomorphism wing of the um, tilting sheaf has to be finite global dimension. And that is a weaker version of this condition here. Um, so, but this is trivial since for regular E, so no, so actually this we apply to that one, every resolving subcategory is finitely resolving. Yeah, I mean, if you have enough projectives, every resolving is finitely resolving. Yeah, done. Um, yeah, then there are some other versions. If you really know only uh, that E is regular and not more infinity T, um, then you can you still get a triangle equivalence from DBE to, to the perfect um, complexes in more infinity T. And this is just a um, thick subcategory generated by the projectives here, which is just T. Um, 
yes, it's not very deep. Um, okay, and this is uh, my main theorem. If E is an exact category with enough projectives, the following are equivalent. E is equivalent to finitely resolving subcategory of mod infinity P as an exact category equivalent. And there's an N and N0 and an N tilting subcategory of E, which is IDEC N tilting. And every N tilting subcategory of E is IDEC N tilting. Um, yeah, and this then um, is a generalization of this um, uh, situation for mod tilting modules over RT in algebras. Um, because then, of course, finite modules over an RT, finite dimension, finite generate modules over an RT in algebra um, are just a category of this form. Yeah, every abelian category with enough projectives is of this form, mod infinity P. Yeah, because then the inner motor embedding is actually an equivalence. Um, right, so, uh, and this strategy of proof is just a, a generalization of, um, of a result of Miyashita, um, which is again a generalization of Brenner Butler. Um, okay, let's take an easy step backwards in the easiest situation. Uh, we look at E to be just um, a semi simple, so E is all the projectives itself. Then we can take T just again, the whole category. This is the only zero tilting subcategory. We have no other choice. Um, and also the only tilting subcategory. And then E is finitely resolving in mod infinity P. Um, if and only if mod infinity P is regular. Yeah, so everything has a fine, I mean, so the, yeah. So E is just a projective in mod infinity P and regularity just means um, everything has a finite um, projective resolution. So rest P equals mod infinity P, and this is just this finitely resolving. Yeah, so T is um, IDEC zero tilting in E, if and only if mod infinity P, uh, mod infinity P, yeah, T, P, else is it's all the same. Um, if and only if this category is regular, yeah, this mod infinity category. Um, yeah, so sometimes is, sometimes it isn't. Um, Okay, the other situation um, uh, I care about was this Ausner Solberg situation. This means now we want to look at exact substructures. That wasn't covered in the previous result. Um, so, yeah, so if E is an exact substructure of more infinity P with enough projectives, then every n tilting subcategory of E is also IDEC n tilting. Um, uh, this again, one just reduces. To the previous situation, um, yeah, you just, um, yeah, I assume directly that E has enough projectives, so I can do the inner motor embedding for E, and then, um, yeah, I use that to come back to the other and show that there's the essential image is um, finitely resolving, um, right? And yeah, so if you don't have enough projectives, um, I don't. I, yeah, the problem is, um, uh, yeah, I don't really understand Keller's proof <laughs> of Ricard's result for functor categories. Um, yeah, that is the problem here. And uh, else this conjecture would be trivial. <laughs> um, yeah, so the conjecture is um, E has at least one n tilting subcategory. Um, so assume one has at least one n tilting subcategory, and then um, there exists an n IDEC tilting if and only if every m tilting is IDEC n tilting. Um, that's the conjecture that this property is just in the whole pole set uh, given. Um, we can prove it for every connected component and um, in the case with enough projectives, we know it. Um, and so this is equivalent to the existence. And we also conjecture that this means that DBE is a triangle equivalent to a functor category of this form, such that um, if you restrict to the finite six subcategory generated by the finite projective dimension elements, um, you get um, just the, the perfect complexes here. Um, yeah. Um, again, uh, yeah. If you, if there's a general enough version of Ricard's theorem for functor categories, this would follow from it. Um, yeah, but I, I struggle with that literature, I must admit still. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so there are many situations where we get um, uh, this IDEC tilting. It's not always the case, but um, it's often enough the case, I hope. Um, so, and the, the complete characterization is still outstanding. Um, yeah, so in the case, for example, finitely resolving, for example, for every abelian category with enough projectives, then IDEC tilting uh, and tilting equals IDEC and tilting. Or um, if you have, um, if you happen to know that mod infinity t, yeah, that um, mod infinity t is regular, then IDEC tilting. Yeah, okay. There, there's also a version of IDEC without an n, but yeah. Okay, then um, examples. This is um, my uh, favorite version of example. Um, unfortunately, it requires some more um, definitions of subcategories, which I already did a lot, but uh, yeah. So the easiest way, that's what I think is the easiest way to obtain so tilting subcategories, yeah? So if you have um, uh, M and E and assume that um, you can look at all the, yeah, so, M co-presentations um, of length n minus one. And you have the extra assumption that home blank M is exact on it. Then we say this X is in cogen n minus one M um, and the Z will be called um, the minus N M syzygy of X. Um, yeah, so this is just this, um, it's like the co-presentation, um, but we make artificially um, uh, M an injective, so the M here injective on it, yeah. Um, if you have some covariantly finite subcategory M, you can um, take the resolution, the approximations, and yeah, and hopefully it's admissible and inflation and so on. Yeah. So you just look at the subcategory where you have such a sequence, and um, the statement is: if you have an exact category with enough projectives. And um, you have a full self orthogonal subcategory of projective dimension smaller equal one. And the projectives are contained in cogen n minus one m. Then you can take m and all the minus n causes g's of your projectives. And this gives you an n tilting subcategory. And even better, we know the perpendicular category is just gen n minus one of m. And um, the easiest situation is if m has projective dimension zero. Um, then we call this, as I call this special tilting. I don't know, that was just the name we gave it, but this is not discovered by us. Many people found these kind of examples. Mm. The easiest situations are RPR tilts and BB tilts, um, or for finite dimensional algebras with positive, positive dominant dimension. I studied these with Pressland, with Matthew Pressland together, and Another very easy situation is um, how you always get this kind of special tilts. You look at endomorphism rings of generators and they always have um, these kind of special tilts. For example, if you have a non commutative resolution of singularities, um, some corn Macaulay generator. So then it's usually of that case, that, that form. Um, so you take a ring and you take an arbitrary module and you take a projective which has a deflation onto M, uh, then you take the direct sum and the endomorphism ring and you take home QE. And then you can take your deflation and you add uh, Q to it, identity on Q, and apply home blank E. And then you get, since this is contravariant, you start with gamma and then you go to P to the N plus one, and then you have some co-kernel. And these are now right modules. Yeah, right gamma modules. And then it's very easy to check that this P plus T1 is a special one tilting um, in mod infinity gamma, so right gamma modules with infinite projective presentation. Yes. Um, and uh, with respect to this uh, subcategory of the projectives. Yeah, so we also know what the perpendicular is, it's just gen P. Um, yeah. And then um, I cared about infinite quiver representations. Um, oh, I'm, I'm, my door is open.
Yeah, so uh, this is uh, studied by Bautista Liu Paquette, um, and they they studied the Osner Wrighton theory for infinite queer representations. Um, and there are many versions of um, representation, the categories of representations you can look at. Um, but if you want Osner Wrighton theory, you want it to be Cole Schmidt, and they wanted it to be um, with enough projectives and and so on, and so they came up with this uh, finitely presented queer representations of the quiver Q. Yeah, so the, the strategy is here, yeah, you make your quiver finite enough such that if you take the projective at a vertex X, the same way constructed in the, as the usual way, um, uh, that this is fi point-wise finite dimensional, because if you um, don't have all these uh, finiteness conditions, this might become infinite dimensional. And then you look at uh, this category, and um, you look at the finitely presented modules with respect to this category. And this is uh, then nothing but this functor category, more infinity p. Um, and this is known to be hereditary abelian with enough projectives called Schmidt. And then um, Bautista Leo Paquet studied also the writing theory for it. Um, yeah, and basically, the, you have only a one sided version in general depending on if you find a path like that or the other way around. Um, but it doesn't matter. It's good enough for, for our purposes. Um, one can still write down the osner writen quiver if you have only right exact, uh, right osner writen or left osner writen, yeah. Um, yeah, it's still good enough for us. So all the indecomposables appear in this kind of um, osner writen quivers, but they're not always um, the, f the first part or the, the last part of an osner of a short, of an um, almost split sequence. Um, yeah, so this is a simple situation where you still have an Osner Wrighton um, category. Uh, we look at orientations of A infinity. And so um, this is just orientations of this quiver, uh, one, two, three, and so on. And the indecomposables are interval modules. I just denote them E, I, J, I is more equal J. Um, yeah, okay, right, actually this I don't need. And uh, look at the orientation, everything going into, uh, yeah, into one. Um, so uh, so with a unique, so an infinite path uh, like that, with a unique um, sink. And so in this case, rep plus Q is, um, is an Osner Wrighton category with enough projectives. And um, you can just do knitting on the interval modules. And here you see, these are your projectives and um, you continue to the right. You have no injectives and um, yeah, it looks like your usual type A quiver. Um, yeah, and then you can uh, look at, for example, at uh, this um, yeah, a slice of tau, so to say. Um, uh, you look at all the um, uh, indecomposables with um, simple sockle um, S2, as well as your uh, simple supported at two. Um, and you can easily see that this is maximal self orthogonal, yeah, has no extensions, um, but it's not tilting since P is not contained in chorus one um, C, yeah. I mean, remember a uh, tilting um, for with enough projective meant that. Um, P has to be contained in chorus 1C, it's a category. Yeah, but here you see the projectives, none of them will ever embed into anything in this line. Yeah, and on the other hand, if you think of, if you wanted to add anything to this, uh, then you become, yeah, then you quickly get an, um, a self-extension. Yeah, um, it's easy to see the self-extensions in this kind of quiver. Um, Okay, this is quite weak, yeah. So there's a bijection, explicit bijection between tilting modules for A and A oriented type A quivers and rooted binary retrieves on the Arsenal Wrighton quiver with roots of projective injective. Um, yeah, I should make a picture, but I'm not sure I, I'm technically able to do this. Um, hmm. um, hmm. Maybe I just draw in the text. Uh, um, right, so, um, so the, the easiest situation is um, A3, let's say. Um, you write down your 
Aus einer weiten Quiver, you have your projective injective on the top, and um, you have your simples on the bottom. And um, a rooted binary tree means I have to take this as a root, and um, then I um, I am drawing these. I should take other colors. Um, um, then I have to go in both directions, and uh, now I can choose um, either. Yeah, I can choose um, branching points, but the point is that I'm not allowing these branches to cross over. And um, I'm kind of have to, um, yeah, I have to choose three vertices, yeah. So for example, here I can choose that one as well. And then, um, so I have to have four leaves on the bottom. Um, yeah, that's a stupid example, but with this kind of combinatorics, one can make, um, one can easily um, describe all the tilting modules and this type A situations, and A and A oriented situations. And uh, for this, this specific orientation of um, type uh, uh, A infinity, the same thing works. You just have to make sure um, uh, that you, you take nested um, binary trees as in the Hiller sense. Um, and the roots always have to lie on these um, uh, they have to lie on this uh, on the line of the projectives, yeah. So you might start with a um, binary tree here, and then so you have infinitely many roots chosen here, which have to be in your tilting category, and then you uh, you take these wedges, and in there you choose your binary trees, and they're nested on each other and getting bigger and bigger. That's how you describe the tilting subcategories, and it's not hard to prove that they're all. Um, yeah, and then this is probably, yeah, I actually don't know if this is known. Um, so if two quivers Q, Q prime of type um, A infinity fulfill that the bounded derived categories of rep plus Q and rep plus Q prime uh, are triangle equivalent, then I claim this is, this is if and only if both contain a right or left infinite path or no infinite path. Um, and yeah, tell me if you know that this is already known. Um, uh, yeah, so part of it is already in Bautista um, Paquette Leo. Um, if Q and Q prime uh, fulfill different conditions in A, so um, either yeah, one A, one B, and so on, so no, not both in the same class, then they're not triangle equivalent. This is because Bautista Paquette and Leo showed that. Um, these bounded derived categories then are also um, here left and here the left aus the right and here right aus the right and here aus the right categories. And so um, if they're in different paths, then they cannot, I mean, then they cannot be triangle equivalent because then the property would carry over. Mm. Yeah, so if they're both in A or in B, one can work with iterated special tilts or co tilts and change finitely many arrows in the orientation. That's very easy. Um, if so, the only cases C both contain no infinite path. And um, yeah, so I'd like to explain how one should prove that. Um, yeah, so a priori we could uh, we could change infinitely many arrows in um, in our. Um, uh, orientations of type A infinity. And this cannot be done with this special tilt uh, formalism anymore. Um, so we need to see given two orientations without any fine infinite paths, are they derived equivalent? And so we look and not look, loot. Um, uh, um, so we look at the, um, oh, what's done? I'm not. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm really a bit an amateur. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm um, sorry for the. Yeah. And so we look at the abelian category A of um, finite dimensional presentations of the double infinite um, path. And uh, since we look only at finite dimensional presentations, um, this is without enough projectives and without enough injectives. Yeah, for that you would have to have um, infinite supports in one direction or the other. Um, 
And this is still an Ausner Weiten category with indecomposables other interval representations as before. And the Ausner Weiten category is very easy, yeah? It's an infinite mesh category of type that A infinity with simples at the bottom line, yeah? And then um, we look at special subcategories in there, uh, uh, subcategories in there given by slices. Yeah, you start at the bottom and then you walk up your um, orientation of your A infinity quiver um, according to how you want it. Um, here slice means that it doesn't contain, um, it doesn't contain an infinite path. Yeah, um, don't know how to do the erasure. <laughs> Okay, um, so it doesn't contain an infinite path uh, to the right or to the left, so um, uh, else it's not allowed. Um, so, and we claim that this thing would always give you an IDEC tilting subcategory of A, yeah? And um, yeah, so if I were able to do a picture. Um, how do I do a picture? Um, right, I, I don't really know how to do the pictures. <laughs> okay, I have to explain it orally. Um, or maybe I can draw it in there. Right, so the Osner Weiten quiver is um, just this thin. Uh, yeah, the problems with the technique. So the Osner Weiten quiver is just this um, infinite mesh. At the bottom, we have our um, simples. Yeah, and now we take as a slice a path infinitely increasing somewhere, zigzagging. Yeah, and then um, T perp is everything here on this side. I mean, I should take a different color now. Um, T perp is everything here. And then one can see easily that T perp has enough projectives given by T. Yeah, if you have an object here, you, you can um, get your projective cover from there and from there. And um, yeah, it's your deflation. Um, and the other thing is that um, if you have anything in, in A, then it's uh, finitely co-resolved by T perp. Yeah, so you only need to take care now of the objects on this side of your slice. And for that, you just uh, approximate in your slice, um, maybe also something to the bottom here. And then you take the co-kernel and you land on T perp. And so you see everything in, um, in A um, has a one core resolution in T perp. It's very easy to see. Yeah, so the only open thing is, is this also IDEC tilting, yeah? Um, and this follows from, you show that the representation, so this category is just nothing but rep plus Q, and um, and this is just a finite dimensional um, dim representations here, but because we don't have any infinite path for the quiver that you find um, when you look at these, uh, you follow the arrows, so to say. Um, and yeah, since this is global dimension one, yeah, this is the regular case. So T is IDEC tilting, done. Yeah, so you don't need to do anything else. You just need to understand that for this um, this very nice, easy abelian category without any enough projectives, enough injectives, we still find tilting subcategories as we knew it. And um, we can just tilt from one orientation to the other via slices. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually all I wanted to say. Yeah, sorry for the pictures. I'm, I'm really a bit out of uh, practice. This is. Yeah, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, Lilia. Can we let's all unmute ourselves and thank the speaker now? <laughs> sorry. Okay, if you have any questions for the speaker, you can ask them now. I, yes, so in the beginning you said there is no standard T structure on the derived category of an exact category. Uh, yes. Do tilting objects give you T structures somehow? Um, yes, if if this um, mod infinity T category happens to be abelian, yes. Okay. But, um, uh, if not, no. I mean, okay. Um, and this situation then essentially just means that you're in some derived category of an abelian category, more or less, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, there are easy criteriums when uh, mod these functor categories are abelian. Yeah, you need to, to look for weak kernels, and it's kind of known mm -hmm. results. Uh, pseudo kernels, they are sometimes called. But mm -hmm. tilting objects should g still give you coty structures, right? Oh, that I actually don't know. Or um, wait, aka weight structures. Yeah. 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 Actually, I don't know. Just so they shouldn't have negative homs, right? That's the only thing that matters. Yeah. Yeah. Then you then you would get coty structures. Hmm. But I'm not sure how useful they are on their own without adjacent or orthogonal T structures. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, yeah, it would be nice to find a more general notion of a T structure for this DB of an exact categories. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the standard thing should recover E from DBE. So it can't be a T structure unless E is a billion, right? Yes. Correct. <laughs> it must be some other notion generalizing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lucas. Any other questions for the speaker? Um, okay. You had this conjecture about the connectedness of this poset set right before yeah. you started talking about uh, direct tilting, I think. Yeah. What's the conceptual explanation for why one might expect that conjecture to go one way or the other? Um, I mean, the philosophy is always that for exact categories with enough projectives, the whole thing is trivial. And um, in the other cases, it's probably also true, but hard work. And um, I don't know, that was what I observed in some other situations. And so I also conjectured it here. Um, yeah. I don't know, it would imply that um, some other conjectures are true that, um, for example, um, tilting is always, um, so if you have one IDEC tilting, then everything is IDEC tilting. That's true on every connected components, uh, component of the um, tilting pose set. And so if you, if you know that the tilting pose set is um, connected, then you're done with that. Yeah, it's one way of trying to prove it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it should not be so hard, but actually I have no attempt, I, mean, I have no starting point to show that this tilting process is connected. It's a rather weak statement, yeah, so. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I should point out that um, in this preprint, um, there is a section um, conjectures um, about um, Ricard's theorem for functor categories. Um, so I have all the confirmation that uh, this kind of follows, I mean, at least what I want would follow from some proof of uh, Keller on deriving DG categories. And um, uh, I really can't see that. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah. So it, it's, um, for me, this is still open because, mm. yeah. Wh which section of Keller paper is that? Uh, yeah, so deriving DG categories, um, they're, they claim that they do um, the Morita theory for functor categories in the introduction. And then section 8.1, they, um, they do a DG version for, um, yeah, for functor categories with an additional um, flatness condition. And mm -hmm. um, uh, so the statement is that the flatness condition can be re removed by um, using some uh, flat resolution. <laughs> and um, then uh, this would give the Ricard theorem for functor categories. Um, but the Ricard theorem has this other aspect of that all these uh, triangle equivalences on the big uh, triangle categories restrict to the smaller um, triangle categories because the smaller triangle categories have intrinsic characterizations. And um, that is not addressed at all in Keller's paper. Okay. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I don't know how it follows from there. Um, Actually, there's also no proof um, in this Keller paper. Yeah, it's kind of assumed that it follows from what's there. I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Any any other questions or comments for Vilia? Well, in that case, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Bye.
。对，好。